Okay. Welcome to this published author's interview. My name is Kenneth Muyingo, and with me I have a special guest that I will be interviewing. First, I just want to mention, if you watch this interview and you would like to write a book yourself to become an author and write your first book, there's a link with the interview for you to join the group, become an author and write your first book to connect with like-minded people who are doing the same. And with that said, I would like to get into the interview by asking my guest to say hello to our viewers and listeners and to introduce herself. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm so thrilled to be with Kenneth. I'm chatting from Netherlands. Is that right? Yes, please. Okay. And, you know, it's really exciting to find somebody who is on um, a mission, which is just as, um, I would say, honest and truth to the core as your own. So, you know, when I read about Kenneth, um, that he's there to inspire people to make their dreams come true and to help them find strength in themselves to persevere and not give up on life. I thought, well, isn't that the journey I've been on for the last 20 years? And so I instantly um, realized, you know, Kenneth and I probably have more in common than we realize. Um, oh. So I'm, I'm thrilled, I'm honored to be um, on this chat with, um, with Kenneth, you know, and to, to know that you have a book out there which will help people find meaning in their lives. Um, I'm trying to do the same through fiction. And uh, I've been working on the Winds of Fire fiction series for 20 years now. So that was, let's rewind back to the year 2000 when the seed of the story fell in my lap. Um, and I wasn't asking for the story, it just fell in my lap. And since then, it's been a journey, um, a journey that I've lived parallel to my own real life journey, um, you know, in developing the series, understanding the characters, understanding the deeper issues that I'm dealing with in the series. Um, because there are so many issues that we deal with, um, which we come to realize much later on in life. Um, and like many of you, I wish that when I was younger, um, when I was still trying to figure out my life, not that I figured it out now, by any means. <laughs> um, but I wish I had had somebody to say, you know, um, this is probably what you're dealing with. This is probably what you're going through. Um, and you don't have to make life that hard. The answer is easier than you think it is. You just have to find it within yourself. Wow. That is powerful stuff. Thank you so much, Andrew. And, um, and what you're sharing there, it's just, loaded with potential if i could say it like that that sometimes we're looking for the answers on the outside of us or in things and maybe sometimes even in other people but then only to realize that we're looking in the places so if somebody's watching this interview and they would like to know more about Anjo, what can you share with them what can i share with you um one is I'm on all the social media platforms that I can possibly manage, and I'm not a techno whiz by any means. Ask my kids. They'll tell you how awful I am at texting, um, you know, how far behind I am on social media. But uh, what I love about social media is the ability to connect with people and find my tribe. You know, I found you, Kenneth, um, all the way in the Netherlands. We're on the same mission. Um, mm -hmm. And I found other authors, other writers, um, other organizations um, through social media and, you know, through the power of being able to connect. So, for example, if you go on Facebook, you'll find me, um, Anju Gatani Author. If you go on Instagram, you'll find me on Anju underscore Gatani 27. If you go on Twitter, you'll find me on Anju underscore Gatani. Um, and my website, of course, AnjuGatani.com. So there's enough Anju, I think, in the last four sentences. <laughs> Amazing. Um, we'll share those links with the interview as well. Sure. Thank you. Um, so that's what I can tell you about, you know, um, where you can find me. And, you know, but how did I find myself? Um, that's another question, which, you know, in terms of the writing, I've been a writer, a professional writer for over 30 years now. Wow. Um, the first 10 years, um, I was published in lifestyle magazines and publications across Hong Kong, India, Singapore, um, and the U.S., and, you know, I was making a lot of uh, cover features, articles in terms of short fiction. Um, I was also doing columns, contributing to columns. I did a lot of articles on parenting, child psychology, uh, which was my, one of my favorites. 
Um, but, you know, here I was getting published in all these magazines, but I didn't know any other writer who was a professional writer working from home, raising two kids with a husband who was traveling for work um, pretty much all the time. So I didn't know anybody else who was like me. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, when you're getting published, it's all wonderful to see your name, but you're like, is there anybody out there who is like me? Am, am I the only species here? You know? Um, and so that's the power that I found with um, social media. I have been able to find other people like myself. Um, and even through joining chapters and writing organizations, I've actually been to so many chapter meetings and, you know, participated with writing organizations and physically been in room full of writers, um, which is just the power of finding your own people is overwhelming. It's overwhelming. And I totally agree with you. And so the book series is Winds of Fire. The series is Winds of Fire. And this is book one. Um, Duty and Desire, uh -huh. which came out on June 2nd, 2020. So she's, she's still a baby. She's new. Um, but she has a lot to say. And, you know, the main character, um, of course, that's just the cover. But you can imagine her the way you want. Her name is uh, Sheetal Prasad. And the story, basically, it's about a modern young Indian woman in today's India, not yesterday's India, not your grandmother's India or your mother's India, today's India, which is flourishing and has been flourishing for the last 15, 20 years with an economic boom. And this woman is promised the perfect lifestyle, the perfect husband, the perfect family. And she gives up the love of her life to fulfill the family duty. And she finds out she's in a dysfunctional family full of lies, deceit, and betrayal. And that is where the series begins. Wow. Duty and desire. Yep. Which is, Kenneth, um, I, I've realized, you know, it's something we all face in our lives every time. Duty versus desire. You know, you're raising kids, um, but you want to take out the time to write your book. And you have to ask yourself, well, do I prepare dinner or do I write my book? duty versus desire. Um, you know, you're, you're going out to a restaurant with your husband and you had your choice yesterday and then you kind of both argue over what should we have for dinner? Where should we go? Uh -huh. And you have to ask yourself, should I think about myself, desire versus duty? Because technically now it's his turn. Yeah. Um, and we face that conundrum, I would say, every few minutes of our lives. We just don't yeah. realize it because we're so used to balancing the two sides. Wow. And the way you talk about it, you have like zeroed in on it. You realize it when it's happening. And maybe I have a question here. If somebody is watching this and they find themselves struggling with this, with balancing duty and desire, what would you share with them knowing what you know? Um, from what I've learned, I would say, ask yourself, what is your priority? Number one you know, is there a time bound priority um, that something needs to be addressed first and must happen in the next five or 10 minutes, then that has to take precedence. Um, and it may, it may very well be a desire, not even a duty, um, you know, and sometimes things can flip around because, you know, life doesn't happen. It's one and done. Life is a long chain process. And sometimes you start um, fulfilling a duty and as you begin to carry it out, you know, habits, for example, habits don't change instantly. They take a good three weeks to change any yeah. habit that you apply. Um, and as that habit becomes a part of you and it becomes ingrained in you, um, who knows that habit then also changes your own personal preferences to desires that you would not have otherwise chosen. I see. It's, uh... so it's really a question, um, I would say, of priority. You know, ask yourself whether you're a writer, whether you're a homemaker, whether you're an IT person, whether you're a librarian. We face these choices every minute of our life. Um, and I would just say, ask yourself, what is most important right now for you? what is most important in that moment and then address it's that and then it. get into the everything else yeah not yesterday not tomorrow right now when you have to make the decision right now exactly and what happens in most cases is we try to live in yesterday and tomorrow and not 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 much 
in the moment. And this, what you're talking about is right now, in this moment, address it, what is important and take care of that. And take care of it. In fact, there's a very, very powerful book that I read um, called The Power of Now by Eckhart Tolle. Um, it is, I think, the most powerful book I have read until now. Um, it's not an easy read by any means. It's, it's hard. You know, you, can, you cannot read the whole book in one go, even though it's nonfiction. You kind of read little slivers of chapter because it's so deep and so meaningful. Yeah. And that's precisely what Eckhart Tolle um, says. You know, one of the many things he says is that, you know, when you're trying to deal with issues, whether they're emotional baggage that you carry around or whether it's indecision, or whether it's confusion and uncertainty. Um, the primary driver should be, as of this moment right now, what is it you need to do? Our brains, however, are wired differently to think about before and after. You know, our, our brains um, always decide the future and what we need to do based on past experience. Indeed. Which is what the, brain is, the brain's function is. You know, you can't blame the brain there. Um, <laughs> That's what it's meant to do. But I think we have to take um, another step higher, another level, and mm -hmm. ask ourselves, as of this moment, right now, when I'm faced with two, three, four different choices, what do I need to do right now? Um, not, not for anybody else, but for myself. Wow, that's, that's powerful. And the book is The Power of Now but by... The Power Eckhart. of Now by Eckhart Tolle. Fantastic very, book. Very nice. Thank you so much for sharing that. And so let's go back to duty and desire. Okay. What inspired you to write this book? Would you believe me if I told you that the story fell in my lap? Yes, I would believe you. Good, <laughs> because no, very, so not everybody does. Um, so we had just moved from Singapore to the U.S. And, you know, my kids were really young that time. Um, my husband had just started his new job here. And um, my career as a freelance journalist ended because the publications I was working for didn't have the social media platforms back in 2000 as they do now. Yeah. So all the doors had closed in on me, every one of them. My entire career came to a close and I wasn't allowed to work in the US because I didn't have a working visa. I was on a dependent visa. So that's just asking for depression to hit, you know, being stuck at home in the cold weather in New Jersey uh, with two kids while you're still trying to figure out and convert degree Fahrenheit to degree Celsius, um, kilograms to pounds, ounces, and you know, all the measurements. You're driving on the wrong side of the road, technically, so you're yeah. trying not to crash into people. Um, and then you find out that, you know, the career that you've been developing and building has come to a close. Um, so this story, the seed, fell in my lap back around in November. And I saw then what was now, now the end of book two. Oh. And I had no clue what I was dealing with. I knew it wasn't short fiction because experience as a writer, I knew this is bigger than, larger than short fiction. Oh. But I also didn't know what I was dealing with. I also thought maybe I'm going a little nut up, nuts up here, you know? Oh. Um, because it was, it, was a, it was like a movie that I had watched, but that movie didn't exist anywhere. So that's where the journey began. And I talked to my mom, who's known me, you know, as a writer since well, I was first published at the age of seven. I talked to my husband, who could clearly see something is agitating the hell out of me. And I couldn't get the story out of my head. So um, I think it was February, around January, February, um, I started writing the story. And I'm old fashioned, so I put pen to paper. And I started at writing out the first draft. Um, and that first draft took me 18 months um, to pound out on paper. So that's how hard. Without anything typed, pen to paper, 18 months, and then was, first draft was out of here. That was the very first draft. Um, and that was about, I would say, 280,000 words that I had written. Um, when I finished 80,000. And I didn't know what I had <laughs> written. So yeah. I was like, Ooh, this is exciting. What have I written? I didn't know. Um, I knew nothing about genre. I knew nothing about, um, you know, the different categories in writing. 
I knew nothing about the world of publishing in the U.S. Um, I knew absolutely nothing. All I knew was I had this huge story and I had a sequel running in my head. Um, I joined professional writing organizations when we moved to Atlanta and I had the, you know, I was very, very blessed. I had um, a New York Times bestselling author and a USA Today bestselling author who took me under their wing. Um, and I'll never forget this, you know, Haywood Smith, who's a USA Today bestselling author, she, she read my first three chapters and the first thing she said to me is, honey, you need to learn how to write. <laughs> and I was like, teach me, somebody teach me. Yeah. Um, so she took me under her wing and then Jade Lee, who is a USA Today bestselling author, um, sorry, Haywood Smith is New York Times bestselling author. Um, she took me under her wing and she, both authors started working with me on the first three chapters of the book simultaneously. Um, and then as we, I, I attended writers' conferences, I attended um, publishers' panels, writer panels. Um, I learned what the experts had to say. I made notes after notes. I studied, I talked, I networked. Um, I started finding people who were like me. I found people who were just as lost as I was. Um, it was, you know, pure celebration for me of finding my tribe. Um, then I began to realize over the course of several years that what I had written was not one book, but two books. So I had to divide, I had to kind of cut the book in the middle and slice it. Wow. Um, I had to shuffle scenes around um, because there was something in book two which belonged in one. There was something in one which belonged in book two. Um, and so I had to separate the two books and I had to put the sequel in my head aside because I couldn't deal with it that point of time. Um, and, you know, I started learning about the publishing industry at the same time, agents, what do agents do, what do publishers do, how do publishers work with agents, vice versa, um, what is the process, the timeline, the time frame, how do you approach agents, cover letters, query letters, you know, knowing the market, I had to understand the market. It was, um, it was just a whole new world and, you know, I think I was very lucky that um, while raising two little boys, I also had the time to do all this because the biggest issue that I think professional authors faced in what I read was not having the time. Yeah. And technically, because I couldn't work, it was actually an advantage for me. Um, you know, I could really, really focus and hone in on the craft of writing and bringing this story up. But, you know, I haven't worked on it alone. I've been very fortunate. I've had so many experts um, who have helped me develop a story, who have taught me how to write and how to do it right and help me find my own voice, which is something really you, you have to do as a writer. Okay. Wow, that's very powerful. And so would you say that the role that these um, best-selling authors played in your life in that season was sort of like mentors? They took you by the hand and guided you through the process and showed you the way. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, they, I would say they're more than mentors. Um, they're, they're a phone call away. Yeah. I can text any one of them. I can call any one of them at any point in time and say, I need help. I don't understand what's going on. Yeah. Um, not just with writing related issues, but personal issues. They know yeah. me so well now, um, you know, and we it's like a family yeah. and, I can reach out to them at any point in time and they'll call me back and say, hey, what's going on? Um, you know, that power of being able to have people who know more than you, who have accomplished more than you, um, and who can guide you is, is invaluable. It's priceless. And then, oh, it's, I think you've, you've said it so well that it's just very important to just have people, a support network. If we Absolutely. Say and, uh, yeah, yeah, reflecting on uh, how the times are right now with the global pandemic and all the restrictions that have come with it, mm -hmm. um, knowing what you know from the journey that you've been on, what would you share with someone who feels like life has dealt them a bad hand in this season? I think life deals everyone with a bad hand. You know, um, you look at celebrities, you look at Bollywood stars, you look at Hollywood stars, um, ask yourself this, they have the money, they have the fame, they have the McMansions, they have the multi-million dollar homes. 
why are so many of them still in depression? Uh -huh. Why are so many of them pill popping? Why are so many of them having affairs, uh -huh. being faithful in their marriages? Ask them, they would probably say, you know what, life has dealt me a bad hand because I'm not as big a star as X, Y, Z. Um, so ask the person, you know, who doesn't have the money to pay the bills. Um, you know, the pandemic has affected all of us in, in so many ways. Some people more than others. Some people, you know, they've lost family members. They've lost spouses. They've lost moms and dads to this pandemic. Um, so I would say, you know, everybody gets dealt a bad hand. It's how you look at it. Yeah. When, I, when I go back 20 years, like I say, I, I joke about it now. And I say, you know, all the doors had closed for me. Imagine being in a country which is brand new. You lose your career. You have no working visa. Um, and you're just stuck at home raising two kids. That's not a good hand, you no, know. <laughs> it really isn't. Like I said, it's a call for depression, you know. Yeah. Sink in. But um, I was very lucky that the story fell in my lap and it was a calling. And yeah. I thought, you know what? I think I'm actually luckier than most people because this is what the majority of authors and novelists have to say. They don't have the time. And here I have all the time that I can gather to learn the craft and learn how to get the story and shape it to where it needs to be. So really, instead of looking at the glass half empty, I looked at it half full. And I continued to fill after that. I didn't stop. That's powerful. You looked at it as half full and then you continued to fill. I continue to fill and now it's overflowing. You know, it continues to overflow because now I'm able to help other writers. I mentor other writers. Um, when we had, you know, conferences and chapters, I would give presentations and I would also help other writers in perfecting their pitch, whether they're querying. Um, I'm mentoring a writer right now with her manuscript and, you know, we do it by email. I schedule phone calls with her. And for me, it's as personal a journey because I get to pay it forward. So when your cup is overflowing, you know, you don't want that overflow to stop. So the best thing to do is to pay it forward, to help other people. Um, the flow, to keep the flow. Keep the flow going, yeah. The, the, way flow. I see it, the way I see it, Kenneth, is, you know, um, if, if I have been given the privilege of having all these people help me, um, and if I have so much knowledge now than I had before, I won't hurt in any way by sharing it with others. I can only benefit others. Yeah, and I, I don't feel, I don't feel that anybody should deserve to go through the 20 year journey that I did. If, if I can, I would like to make that journey a little smaller for them, you know, maybe knock it down to 10 years or six years because you only get one life to live. Indeed. Wow. And that's, that's powerful. Most definitely we only get short at this and, uh, Mm -hmm. That's what we get to do everything that we have to do. And so the first book was published in 2000. So the first book was published in 2011. 2011. Um, it, had, it had a different cover and it, ha it was published by another publishing house. So if you guys find the 2011 version, do not buy it. Um, can, you, can you imagine an author telling you, do not buy my book? <laughs> That's powerful. So That's powerful too, right? <laughs> let's see the, the new cover, the new book. This is the new one, the 2020 version. 2020 version. That's the 2020 version. That's the one you want to buy. Um, you know, I've even gone through the journey of having published with a small publisher and then finding out that the publisher changed their... Um, organization and scheme to a different Christian publishing format, getting my rights back, getting my contract back for my book, um, you know, undoing everything I've worked so hard for. Uh -huh. So I remember in, in 2015, when I got all my rights back, I was like, really, I spent what, 15 years trying to get this book out. And now I'm claiming all, the whole thing back again. Uh -huh. um, which, which author in their right mind would be stupid enough to do that, you know? Um, so I've done it all. I've, I've yeah. had to deal with all of it. But that was a huge learning because um, that advice came from agents who I did not, who didn't represent my work, yeah. but agents who understood um, where, which professional background I was coming from. They gave me the advice 
um, to get the rights back of the book if the publisher has changed their hat. Um, working with lawyers and, you know, um, intellectual property lawyers, learning how to work with them. Um, so, you know, when you're publishing a book, you know, what you have to understand is one, there are two sides. One is the craft, the creative side of the product. The other side is really all about um, the business. Business, yeah. Business, being savvy about lawyers, agent representation. Do you want to self-publish? Do you want to be traditionally published? Do you want an agent to represent you? Do you want to represent yourself? Um, knowing your market, where does your work fit in the market? Um, and then, of course, you know, if you're going the self-publishing route, how would you market your book? Um, because the competition out there is huge, um, you know, with ebooks, e formats, and all these different uh, formats of being able to sell Kindle, Kobo, you know, um, all these different devices which you can get your books out on. So, apart from just being, you know, really savvy on the craft of creating a product, you know how you now also need to know how to market that product. Indeed. That's, I think that's even most important right now in today's uh, day and age. And um, yeah. so you said you, you have been writing for more than 30 years. About 30 years plus, yes, that's right. What would you say got you into writing? If you would remember originally, before you even published or got the idea of the book, what would you say got, into, got you into writing? So it's a combination of factors, I would say. Um, you know, I grew up in Hong Kong um, in the colonial period when it was still under British rule. And the South China Morning Post was the leading English newspaper, English language newspaper, and it still is. Um, and there's a small section in that newspaper that would come out every Sunday called the Young Post Club, which is for children. Um, when they introduced that section of the newspaper on Sunday, they opened up a format for little kids um, to submit their work and if it was you know worthy then it would get published and it could be a drawing it could be a poem you wrote um, it could be anything and i remember when i was seven years old um, and i know that because i have that article published cut out um, i submitted a drawing and it wasn't something writing it was actually a drawing i submitted and i'm awful at drawing by the way so <laughs> it's not like i'm a creative artist or anything but i submitted that drawing and it got published. At seven years old? At seven years old. Um, but what I remember most at seven was seeing my name and my age in brackets um, beneath that published work. And then at nine years old, um, I got published in a little poem that I sent, the same newspaper, and I saw my name and I saw my age. And as a girl, a little girl growing up, I was very, very quiet. Um, didn't used to talk much, kept to myself. And so what I was able to see was for a person, a girl who was very, very quiet, I was able to make a statement on a published newspaper yeah. and everybody could hear me. That powerful feeling um, has carried me through all these years. That, you know, um, I, I'm not the type of person who would speak unless I feel the need to speak. Um, but ask my kids, they'll, they'll tell you a different story. <laughs> <laughs> they'll be like, mom never shuts up. <laughs> yeah. wow. But you know, um, if, if we're in a group of people in a group setting, um, I usually, I wait, I like to hear what everybody else has to say. I observe people, I observe behavior patterns and I speak only if I feel I have something sensible to say. Um, but you know, life teaches you lessons as you go along the way. And in, in all these long bouts of silence, um, I realized that the power of story is huge. And as the, star, the story started to form shape and color, and it started breathing, and the, the characters had a life of their own, um, you know, I was able to address so many issues in this series. Um, and in this one book alone, for example, I deal with issues of abuse, domestic violence, culture, tradition versus modernism in today's India, which has been heavily influenced by Western values, the socioeconomics of mega wealth and extreme poverty, family relationships and the dynamics in extended families, not nuclear families, extended families, the trappings of wealth, 
many of us think, you know, if I had so much money, if I had a mansion the size, if I had a pool in the backyard, I could do this and I could live my life in this way. But wealth has its own trappings. Um, I address that. And of course, the bounds of duty and family honor, which become a noose for many, many families when you have too much money. And so a lot of, you know, fiction out there um, sort of does look at immigrant stories, yeah. um, the coming to America or the coming to the UK or Britain story, um, where people have left a life behind to find a new life in a country abroad. This is the reverse. I'm taking you to a modern India with its very heavy Western influence and the impact that that influence has on the people living there. Wow. And you've got, you know, um, generations and centuries of tradition and culture pulling young men and women in one direction. And you've got the call of Western and modernization pulling them in another direction. So it's a very, very different perspective, um, a new perspective, you know, on the mega wealth of India society. Yeah. That I don't think too many people have really touched up upon. Then, wow, that's that's powerful. Thank you so much. I mean, it's just listening to you address it like this. It just makes sense because most of what we hear, or the stories that are out in the mainstream media, <laughs> is the stories of people coming from home to explore the world, but this from what i understand it's more like coming from the wild back home mm -hmm. it's a different calling yeah. i mean you know um it's a time when india um prospered from a huge economic boom for sure but along with the economic boom came a lot of western values and um you know ideals that really caused a huge conflict um between the generations and the people's style of thinking, behavior patterns, um, especially when it influenced the younger generation um, the way it did. And so, you know, the, it's, it's kind of the same thing, but it's the reverse. It's the effect of Westernization on the people there. So, and you, you don't really have people moving um, to an immigrating status. You actually just have the values. So now, you know, how are things like in a country which is predominantly known, for example, for arranged marriages, um, you know, where women are and men are being told, you don't have to have an arranged marriage. You can find your own spouse and your own partner um, and have a love marriage. How is that going to gel with women and men from previous generation who have always said, no, you have to do it this way, yeah. either our way or the highway. Yeah. You know, that's, that's just asking for a lot of trouble right there. It did. It's <laughs> rocking the board. So oh, say. yeah. <laughs> capsizing it. You're capsizing <laughs> it now. Oh, yeah. Wow. That's, that's profound, Andrew. And uh, so looking, uh, looking back on this journey, uh, what would you say is the one thing that has had the greatest impact on you finally writing books? Would, it, would you say it's the experience that you had when you migrated to the USA and you were home alone with the children, or would you say you would point it back to that experience of being seven years old and having that picture published, or when you were nine years old, or something else? Is there something that you could point to and say, this is it? Oh, that's a really good question. Um, you know, I think, what I would say is the most impact that this journey has had on me is myself exploring the issues that I'm dealing with. Because what I've learned in the process is in trying to find answers for my characters, um, you know, Shito, who is the poor woman who goes through this entire um, journey, her husband, Rakesh, who is the abuser. Um, and a playboy millionaire. And then of course the extended family. Sheetal's parents who are forced to marry her to this man um, out of family duty. So what I realized is, you know, when, when I've been looking at all the different issues that I've been addressing in the book, 
I realized really it's an exploration of questions that I've had for myself for years. Um, because I remember as a, as, a, as a girl, as a teenager, you know, asking my parents, why do we do this this way? Why don't we do it another way? Because I grew up in Hong Kong. So, you, you know, you understand that um, our school itself had over 36 nationalities under one roof. Over 36. So while we did certain things in a certain way in our place, uh, my Korean friends were doing something else. My Japanese friends were doing something else. Um, you know, my Chinese friends were celebrating the festivals of Hong Kong in a different way. Uh -huh. um, and I was doing our festival celebrations in a different way. And I'd be like, well, why can't I celebrate theirs? And mom and dad never said no. They just said, there's only so much we can do, <laughs> you know. Um, and, you know, I would visit the friends, my friends' homes. They'd come over to my place. And as we grew up, I began to realize everybody does things a different way. Uh -huh. Um, as you grow up in different cultures, and uh, you know, people perform rites, rituals, uh, people celebrate, they, you know, the simple concept of Indians celebrate death with white, um, Americans celebrate marriage with white. Look at the contrast, you know, the same color, very I two different perspectives. This. Death in India is celebrated with white. Um, but you know, you have this beautiful bride going up the aisle in a church in white the same color, but it has two very different meanings yeah. um, in each culture. And so, you know, when I look back on the journey that I've had with these books, um, what I've realized is all the issues that I've addressed are really answers that I'm trying to find for myself through the journey of the characters in the series. Um, and I don't think, you know, um, there is a right or a wrong answer. Um, it's not like two plus two equals four. Yeah. Um, with life, there is no right or wrong. You know, um, going back to your question as well of the pandemic and, you know, people who ask, have I been dealt a bad card? Um, is there a right answer? Is there a wrong answer? Or is there no answer? I think it's just answers um, personally that I have been exploring through these books in my journey um, to see if I can come to some sort of conclusion. Um, because really the reason why I'm writing these books is also to help other women, um, other men understand that if you have been dealt a bad hand, if you're in an abusive situation, if you are suffering from domestic violence, um, if you're looking at your life and you feel, I don't have a way out. Um, the problem is a box only has four sides when you look at it from your perspective. Why do you have to be trapped in a box? Why does it have to be a box? Change the shape of what's around you. Open more doors and find more solutions. Because there's always a new way of thinking. There's always a different way of doing something. You just have to open your mind to that. And then the glass, instead of being half empty, is half full. And then it just keeps filling. And then it just keeps filling. I remember that. <laughs> oh, wow. This is amazing. And um, so the second book in the series, mm -hmm. the title is? Lethal Secrets. Lethal. And it, it's up on Amazon for purchase. Um, so you can pre-order the copy. And what it looks at is it looks at Shito, the same woman, the same character in book one, um, eight years later. And the Mega Wealth family continues living their life. Um, and now there's a child involved in this abusive marriage. So what happens now? Because a lot of women, especially women, um, keep these marriages together, especially in India um, and in Asian communities for the sake of the family, to give their children a healthy life, to give them an all-rounded life. And they, they sacrifice their own lives um, putting their children and family first. But my question to the reader out there is, in doing so, are you jeopardizing your child's life? Or are you actually keeping your child secure and safe? That's a very thought-provoking question. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's, uh, wow. And this is Lethal Secrets. Lethal Secrets. Because, you know, um, 
the other thing I learned along the way is, you know, and there's a lot of research that has gone into these books. Um, you know, the important thing I learned along the way is a lot of us, um, whether where or how we classify ourselves, it doesn't matter, but we're very heavily influenced by our past, our childhood, and if we've suffered any traumas, for example, you know, those traumas continue to follow us if we don't address them. Yeah. Um, and some of them are caused by parents, some are caused by family, some are caused by, you know, relatives. Um, and with the past, you'd think that it's over and done with and it's forgotten. According to the timeline, yes, it's over and done with, it's finished, it's no longer there present in today but experience you know we're human beings we're not laptops we're not devices we are affected by what's happened to us because those events shape our lives they shape our emotions yeah. and so when you're dealing with an abuser for example that abuse is not going to go away unless something profound happens to him or her or the situation is changed dramatically Amen. Yeah. So those are, you know, just one of the many, many questions um, that Lethal Secret asks, and along with what does it mean to be a good parent? Um, are you doing your child a service or a disservice by keeping all the walls intact? And mm -hmm. how much, how much, Kenneth, should a woman hold on to? And how many strings should she keep tied up? Um, and for how long? because she's human, she's going to snap one day. When is that breaking point? And what does it take to break down an Indian woman? What does it take? Wow. Because we're women of substance. We are, all of us. Wow. And any woman of color, um, I would say, any woman of color um, from any background, any country, is by, no, by far, by no means, any shorter than or falls back from any other woman of substance. Wow, I'm so glad we did this. It's uh, oh, glad. I'm glad. I'm so glad you enjoyed and, it. Yeah, and I have another question here. If somebody is watching this interview and they find themselves at this place mm -hmm. of being stuck in a relationship that is abusive mm -hmm. and feel like they're stuck and they have no way out. What would you share with them, knowing what you know with being on this journey to write this book? Um, another great question, Kenneth, and a very hard one to answer because there's no right answer. And I'm not a professional, you know, I'm not a licensed psychologist or a therapist or a doctor by any means, but I have worked with them. Um, and so what I can say from my experience in the journey itself on the book is if you feel you are in a situation where you're being abused and you're a victim, the first and foremost is tell somebody. Uh, because a lot of victims are alienated. There's a, there's a very toxic cycle to the whole pattern of abuser and abusee relationships. Um, and usually the abuser will alienate the victim from anyone and everyone around him until he is the sole, whole and sole um, puppeteer, so to speak. Uh -huh. in this person's life. Um, a lot of brainwashing happens as well. And so, you know, victims usually think, um, I'm not thinking straight. They start doubting themselves. They start doubting their own thought process, which is very detrimental. So I would say, talk to somebody, reach out to people. Um, it is not a taboo, it is not a stigma, um, unlike many people make it out to be. Um, you could end up with a mental health issue in the long run if you don't address it now. Um, going back to Eckhart Tolle's book, ask yourself, what is priority for you now? Um, where do you see yourself tomorrow, three days, five years from now? Where would you like to be if you want to get there, if you want to break free? Um, we're all dealt bad hands, but we all have to fight our own battles and we all have to win our own wars. Um, you can get your support from the people around you. You can get network from the people around you. You can get to the professionals. You have to reach out. That's the most important thing. And reach out to as many people as you can um, because nobody knows if you don't let them know. 
Wow. Wow. That's, that's very well said. I'm so glad. And I know somebody will take uh, this to heart, most definitely. Um, I hope. This was amazing. I'm just curious if if somebody's uh, you mentioned the links that they can use to connect with you, Alia. Can you just share what share them again? If somebody would like to connect with you after they've watched this interview, what's mm -hmm. the best way for them to reach out to you? Um, so my website, AnjuGatani.com. That's A N J U G A T T A N I dot com. Uh, my website has a contact page. And, you know, feel free to send me a message um, on that page. Again, I'm not licensed psychologist, psychiatrist, none of that. I'm just a fiction author. But um, that's one way to reach out to me. The other is Instagram, which is Anju underscore Gatani um, 27. Um, Twitter is Anju underscore Gatani. And, of course, I'm on Goodreads as well, um, Anju Gatani author and, good, and uh, Facebook, Anju Gatani author as well. Um, that's, you know, those are ways that you can reach me for sure. Um, and what I would say is, you know, when I realized um, the potential that this book has, um, I will say this, there is a lot of wonderful nonfiction book out there. You know, The Seven Highly Habits of Effective People by Stephen Covey, Eckhart Tolle's book, like I said, The Power of Now, um, Patricia Evans' books, um, verbally abusive, controlling people. Uh, she's, she's, she's phenomenal. I did a lot of my research from her books. Um, and they're great nonfiction books, but what happens is the power of fiction. Fiction has the ability to take the reader into an alternate um, universe. And, you know, reading is an emotional experience, just like watching movies. Huh. Um, but what happens with fiction is you have the power to go in another person's, um, another character's mind time, place, and it becomes an emotional experience. And you can, if the writer is able to, you can feel the power of what they're trying to say, but more importantly, you can see and ask yourself, am I feeling this right now? Is this what I'm going through? Is this what I'm being subjected to? And you know, there's great fiction out there. Um, a lot of wonderful fiction out there which deals with emotionally abusive topics, um, you know, whether it's colored, non-colored, it doesn't matter. It's the topic itself, which is close at heart. So if you feel and if you can identify with the characters and the abusive situation you're going through, ask yourself, if this is what I'm feeling, maybe I need to consider where I'm at in my life and in my place in society and at home. Because fiction has the power to do that, which nonfiction doesn't. Yeah. Um, and maybe it may not be you, it may be somebody else. Ask yourself, is my best friend going through this? Do I think she's dealing with this? Um, she may be too afraid to reach out for you, to you, but there's nothing to stop you from reaching out to her or him. And just asking. Not just, hey, how are you? But asking, be bold enough to ask, um, are you dealing with this? Yeah. Do you need help? And, you know, before they say, yes, I need help, find an answer for them and lead them to that help, a professional. Wow, thank you so much. And uh, so you mentioned that the books are available on Amazon. They're available on Amazon, that's right. Um, if you click, you know, just punch in Duty and Desire on Jugatani, you'll see the 2020 version um, out there. And I would say, you know, it's, it's a story, it's a series, but um, you may find more hidden layers than just the story on the surface. Um, as I said, you know, I deal with a range of topics and if you can get this book in the hands of somebody who you feel might benefit from it, um, that's what kept me going for 20 years, being able to help other people out there in their journey. Um, because, you know, when you're a creative artist, you never know who you can help and who you can reach out to with your creative work. Indeed. Wow. Uh, this was very inspiring, Anju. I'm Thank so you. glad that we made time for it. Um, is there anything else that you would like to share that I have not been able to address in the interview? 
Um, I think you've hit on all the great questions, you know, and um, I couldn't have come up with uh, any other questions myself, except um, I would just like to say, you know, if you've enjoyed the read, um, please, you know, take the time to leave me reviews on Amazon because after 20 years, um, I'm not giving up. I'm going to continue with this journey and your reviews um, really help other people find the books they need to read. Um, whether it's my book, whether it's another author's books, whether it's somebody's nonfiction book. Um, and I'm a huge advocate because I'm so tired of advertising and flashing my own books. I'm actually one of those people who, who will tell you to buy somebody else's book, which is what I've already done, <laughs> you know? Um, so take that time because authors put in a lot of their life blood um, into giving and shaping the works that we do. Um, so if you can take out the time just to leave a review, um, you never know your review could help someone else navigate to the book that they need in, at their time, at their point in life now. So thank you. That's, that's what I could say. That is very well said. I'm so glad we made time for this. And I will sure be keeping in touch with you. Thank you, Kenneth. I appreciate you having me. It's been great talking to you. And I really appreciate the time that you took, um, you know, so much interest in my book and all the way from Netherlands reaching out to me. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's really, I feel honored. So thank you. You're welcome.